What's up, boys and girls? CJ here, your Vegas Insider. Today we're continuing with our 2019-2020 college basketball preseason preview series. Uh, yesterday we did number 25. We had Vermont slated in there at number 25. Uh, today we're doing number 24. We're going to count them all the way down to number one. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it with the number 24, Harvard Crimson. Today we have another mid-major in our countdown. Uh, so far, two teams, two mid-majors. Mid-majors are great because they present the opportunity to make a lot of money. Uh, I've never seen a mid-major win the NCAA tournament, uh, except for UNLV back in 1990. But you really can't count them. They were, they were a mid-major because they played in the Big West, but they were a complete anomaly. Uh, they had an NBA-loaded roster from top to bottom. They had three first round draft picks in the NBA that season from that 1990 championship team. Uh, outside of that, I've never ever seen a mid-major team win the championship. So when you bet mid-majors on the future lines, you tend to get extreme value. Um, you know, 1,000 to 1, 500 to 1, 750 to 1, even with really, really good mid-major teams. Uh, yesterday we previewed Vermont, a really good mid-major team at 1,000 to 1. Uh, today we're previewing Harvard. Their odds aren't quite as high because they have an unbelievably strong roster from a talent standpoint. Uh, the highest I've seen Harvard's odds so far going into the preseason is 400 to 1 at MGM. Well, that's currently the highest odds that they have now. I actually picked up Harvard at 1,000 to 1 when the odds first came out uh, back in April and May, right after last season ended. I also bet it again at 750 to 1 when they were lowered a little bit. But now the highest you can find uh, in town on them is, is only 400 to 1, but that's still a, a good long shot. That's still a really good price from a uh, total risk reward standpoint. And I think the reason that the odds have fallen so much on this team is because people are realizing that they have a uh, incredibly talented roster with a very, very high ceiling. If you look back at this team, if you look at the roster that they have now, th this recruiting class has stayed together since 2016. It was a top 25 recruiting class in 2016. Uh, everybody that was in that class is still on the team as seniors, which you never see in college basketball anymore. Uh, you see it at Harvard because these kids are staying in school to get, you know, the best education money can buy at an Ivy League school. So, the, the, you know, kids in the Ivy League won't leave as early as, you know, kids at other schools. So the potential is there for this team to be really, really good this season. Uh, I would put their roster... Uh, I would match them up uh, about against just about anybody and feel good about Harvard coming out with a win. I mean, they're that good. If you put this roster up against um, any Pac-12 roster, say, uh, I think Harvard could compete like for a top three spot in that conference. Uh, this is a really good team. The question marks with this team uh, have been uh, defense, consistency, they've had some injury problems, and some people are questioning uh, Amaker's coaching ability. There's no questioning his recruiting ability. He's out-recruited the, the rest of the Ivy League by leaps and bounds. But with this class that he recruited in, in 2016, all being seniors now, uh, the time is now for Harvard. There's no more excuses. Uh, you know, last year they had a key injury to Seth Towns, who was the 2017 Ivy League Player of the Year. He missed the entire season last year. The year before, their starting point guard, Bryce Aiken, uh, missed a lot of the year. Uh, these two guys are Harvard's two best players, uh, power forward or, and, and uh, point guard. So now they're both healthy. The roster's intact. They're all seniors. I mean, this is the year for Harvard. Uh, and... Anything less than a single-digit seed in the NCAA tournament and an outright uh, Ivy League championship is going to be a major, major disappointment for this team. Now, uh, you know, as far as Amaker being on the hot seat this year, I'm not sure if that's the case because he's still recruiting at an absolutely elite level. Uh, he, you know, he's had good recruiting classes uh, besides just the 2016 class, and he has 
potentially his best recruiting class coming in next year. Uh, he's already landing some top 100 recruits for the 2020 uh, recruiting class. So I don't necessarily think Amaker's on the hot seat this year, but it would be really distressing and really disappointing to a, if you're a Harvard fan or alum, if you guys don't make the tournament with a single digit seed. And I'm not even talking like the typical Ivy League 12 or 13 or 14 seed. This is a really good team. This, this, this team should be at least a number eight seed in my opinion. Uh, if they're not wearing their home uniforms the first game of the NCAA tournament, then I consider the regular season a disappointment. All right, so let's go. Let's get on really briefly with what happened last year. Like I said, they barely missed out on the NCAA tournament. They finished 19 and 12, 10 and 4 in league play. Uh, you know, which is okay. It's not great being that they're in the Ivy League. They shouldn't have much competition with this roster. They did go to the NIT last year. Coach Amaker's record at the school is 230 and 131. So definitely not a bad record there. Um, one of the keys, one of the things that makes me uh, so optimistic about their team this year is they lost no key players off of last year's team. Like I said, uh, the 2016 recruiting class, uh, all the seniors that you see listed here on the virtual whiteboard, they were all the key players last year. They're all returning. They had the Ivy freshman of the year, Noah Kirkwood. Uh, he averaged double figures in scoring last year, so he could easily make that you know freshman to sophomore leap that so many good players make and become even a more efficient player and even a more dangerous player to add to this group of seniors. Uh, Harvard also has another good recruiting class coming in. They have a top 100 recruit, Chris Ledlam, coming in. He's a 6'6 wing, small forward type, so it's just, a, it's just an embarrassment of riches uh, in the talent department at Harvard. Uh, like I said, talent is not an issue, size is not an issue, experience is not an issue. So, uh, you know, I think Amaker is going to put it together. I think he's going to figure it out this year coaching this team. And, you know, knock on wood, they stay injury free. And this could be a very, very dangerous team that can easily reach the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. The future odds in Vegas at the sportsbooks are telling you that this is a team that can reach the second weekend. When you go from 1,000 to 1 to 750 to 500, I mean, a lot of places in town now have Harvard only 100 to 1 to, uh, to win the championship. So that tells you that uh, the Sharps in town, they're on this team. Uh, four, the, I told you about 400 to 1. That's the absolute highest number on this team right now. That's at the MGM. So if you're a fan of Harvard or if you're high on them, I would absolutely suggest that you make it to an MGM book and bet it there because I've seen, I've seen books in town as low as 75 to 1 on Harvard. So let's go ahead and get back to the roster. Um, like I was saying, they have no key losses from last year. What do they have coming back? Well, the senior class that I'm showing you up on the board here. Uh, you have an outstanding point guard in Bryce Aiken. Uh, this is a more of a score first point guard, uh, but I, he definitely has the opportunity to be a great distributor as well. There's so much talent at every position. And it, it, this is going to be a hard team to guard because anybody on the floor can beat you from any spot. It's really exciting to see what's going to happen when they extend the three-point line. I think it's really going to open up the spacing for this team. And especially being in the Ivy League, I don't think the rest of the Ivy League has the talent to be able to guard these guys uh, opening up the floor. You have Seth Towns coming back from injury. Like I said before, he missed all of last season, but he was the 2017 Ivy League Player of the Year. Let's go ahead and look at his numbers here. Got my uh, thorough notes. He uh, averaged 16 points a game and 5.7 rebounds per game in 2017. Now, you lost all of that production last year. You're getting it back this year. On top of that, we have, um, you know, uh, well, he's a 6'7", kind of a small forward. And then you have at power forward, uh, you have Chris Lewis, another senior, 6'9". Uh, he averaged two blocks a game last year, 10.5 points per game. So uh, he's a very productive player, rim protector type, bruiser type. Uh, Harvard has plenty of size. If you go, uh, you have uh, at 6'8", you have another junior forward, Danilo uh, Duracic. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he's another 6'8 guy down low. You have Robert Baker, a 6'11 power forward type, another rim protector. So uh, uh, Henry Welsh. Uh, who I didn't list here, 
but he's 6'10". He's a 6'10 senior. So you have plenty of size and plenty of depth with this team. There's no reason Amaker can't go as, as high as 11 or 12 deep with this team. I was talking about the uh, top 100 freshman coming in this year, Chris Ledlam. I mean, he might even take a red shirt. I doubt it being a top 100 guy. I think they'll find a spot for him to play and get minutes this year. But I wouldn't even be surprised if he redshirted this year. This team is so deep. I think they have seven or eight seniors who all could play. You have Kyle Ketchings, a sophomore. You have uh, Noah Kirkwood, who I mentioned before. The uh, last year's Ivy League freshman of the year. So there's absolutely a lot to love about this team, and that's the reason I'm so high on them. I still think they're, I still think they're a decent play at 400 to one. You're still risking a little to win a lot. You get to follow the team all season long. Say you take, uh, say you take fifty dollars and put it on Harvard at MGM to win the championship. You have entertainment all season long for fifty bucks. And if they won the national title, you win what uh, twenty thousand, and you don't even—they don't even have to win the title for you to win money. They could make the elite eight or the final four, and you can hedge down from there. That's something I will teach you how to do if you uh, stay tuned to this channel. I will teach you all about hedging, middling, in-play bets, things like that, to where you can win on a big future like this without Harvard even winning the championship. A real quick dive here into the uh, uh, season stats from last year. This team really underachieved to me. They really did. They scored 71.7 and gave up 70.1. So that was only a margin of plus 1.6 per game in the scoring department. That's not very good, especially considering they play in the Ivy League. That number should have been way better. I know that in the non-conference, uh, they were they performed very poorly last year. They got outscored badly against the upper end you know, teams that they played last year. I, I look for a lot of improvement in that this year. Field goal percentage was 46%. That's not bad. It was second in the Ivy League. Field goal percentage defense was 43.5. Now, that wasn't great. That was 157th out of 353 Division I teams. It only ranked fifth in the Ivy League. So they need to tighten up the defense for sure. Three-point shooting was 36%, which is okay. Free throw shooting, 72.1%, which, you know, that's okay. 125th out of 353 teams. It's not great, but it's not a huge liability. Uh, being that all these players are coming back and they all played last year, I would expect that number to improve. Uh, assists per game, 11.9. That ranked 280th. Seventh in the Ivy. That is a concern. So with Bryce Aiken, he's averaging 22.2 points. That's outstanding for a lead guard. That's outstanding for anybody in college basketball. He's one of the top scorers in the country last year. Uh, the assist numbers were kind of low. I think you can improve that. He has enough talent around him to get the ball to the guys where they want it, where they can score, uh, instead of him just being a uh, score first all the time. Instead of him being option one, turnovers per game. This is the real issue for this Harvard team. Last year, they averaged 15.8 turnovers per game. That is absolutely unacceptable. That ranked 334th, near the bottom in the entire country. It was 8th in the Ivy League. They have got to fix that. And if they do that, which I think they will, it's just going to make them that much better this year. It's going to take them from... Barely missing out on the tournament, you know, making it to the Ivy title game and barely losing to actually running through the Ivy League, maybe even getting an at-large bid, uh, whether or not they win the Ivy tournament. But to me, that is what's going to take them to the next step from being a team with a lot of potential to just being a really good team and possibly a ranked team all season. Cut down on the turnover. All right, so let's go ahead and put the uh, non-conference portion of the schedule on the uh, virtual uh, whiteboard here. As you know, I don't talk about the conference schedule. If you're a fan of Harvard or if you study college basketball or follow this team at all, you know they're in the Ivy League. You know who's in your league. But what I would like to do is talk about some of the key non-conference games. And especially for these mid-major teams, your non-conference schedule can easily be the difference between getting a bid on Selection Sunday, and being one of the first teams left out and playing in the NIT. So let's go ahead and put the schedule on the board here. Uh, it's not a bad non-conference schedule, uh, especially because the games that are listed in red here, uh, that's the Orlando Invitational. It's actually one of the better 
preseason tournaments in all of college basketball. And they're going to get an uh, opportunity, a couple of opportunity for some good wins there. Let's go ahead and start off with what they have. November 8th, they open at Northeastern. Uh, Northeastern was a tournament team last year. They got the auto bid from the Colonial last year. Uh, they lost to Kansas in the first round. But, you know, to start the season going on the road against a tournament team from the year before, uh, that, that's a good game to open the season. Uh, November 14th, they have Siena at home. I just put, I threw Siena in there because they are the favorite in the MAC this year. So uh, they could easily be another tournament team. Uh, that they will have on their resume. So that's an opportunity for a decent win. Uh, November 16th, they play Buffalo in Toronto. Buffalo was one of the best uh, mid-majors in all of college basketball last year. They would have had an at-large bid even if they didn't win the MAC. The MAC, as opposed to the MAC. Anyway, uh, I watch too much college basketball. So they have that game against Buffalo, uh, another possible tournament team. Buffalo, uh, they're completely overhauling their roster from last year, but they are still one of the favorites in the MAC. So that could be another uh, eventual um, uh, tournament team, that, uh, another quality win that they can have on their resume there. Then uh, November 28th, the Orlando Invitational kicks off. They play Texas A&M. I don't expect Texas A&M to be um, a very good team in the SEC, but that doesn't mean they won't be a decent team. The SEC, for my money, might be the best league top to bottom this year. Actually, top to bottom, it is the best league in the country this year. Their bottom is tougher than the bottom of the ACC, the bottom of the Big Ten, in my opinion, uh, even you know the bottom of the Big East. The SEC is going to be a real grind. So even though I don't expect Texas A&M to finish very high in the SEC, they could still be a quality team. And uh, we know they have a quality coach in Buzz Williams. So they... They start the Orlando Invitational there with A&M. Then the following day on the 29th, they will, they will play either Maryland or Temple. Uh, either one of these will be a, a, a decent win, but if they play Maryland, now you're talking Quadrant 1, Top 10, Top 15-ish type win. So hopefully, uh, hopefully they'll win, Maryland will win, they'll continue on in the winner's bracket with the game against Maryland, and that gives them a real opportunity to get the kind of a win that would give them an at-large resume, regardless of whether they fall short or not this year in the Ivy League tournament. Um, the last game in the Orlando Invitational will be either against uh, USC, Fairfield, Davidson, or Marquette. It just depends who advances from that side of the bracket to play them. Uh, all of these games will be aired on the ESPN family and networks, either ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN uh, News, so just uh, you know, check your listings for that when it comes up. So that's really that's a really good opportunity to pick up some quality wins there. And after that, we we just have UMass at home at George Washington on December twenty first. A couple of A ten teams. I think the A ten is going to be a really strong league this year. And then you have at Cal on the 29th. I threw that one up there because that's going to be televised on the Pac-12 network. Cal's not going to be a good team. They have a new coach. They will be improved, but I still don't see them as being a very good team. But it is a road win against a Power 6, or a road game against a Power 6 opponent. So if you pick up that win, uh, you know, it means something. And then the day after, since they're in the Bay Area, they take on San Francisco on the road. Uh, USF was a pretty good team last year. They're definitely in that upper quadrant of the West Coast Conference. They're not going to be as good as St. Mary's or Gonzaga this year, but they could be in that third, fourth, fifth place tier. Well, probably not third place. I have BYU there, but they could be that fourth, fifth place tier of the uh, of the WCC. So that could be, a you know, another decent road win. And then uh, they host UC Irvine on January 4th. And that's, you know, another potential tournament team. UC Irvine made the tournament last year. They're the favorites in the Big West again this year. So, you know, with Northeastern, Siena, Buffalo, Maryland or Temple, uh, UC Irvine, I mean, you could be looking at four or five, maybe possibly six tournament teams that they play in their, in their non-conference schedule if all goes well. So this could be a pretty decent non-conference schedule. And uh, it, say they say they lose two or three games in the non-con, and say they lose even two games in the Ivy, which, in my opinion, they shouldn't. There's no way they should lose more than two games in the Ivy League. If they lose more than two games in conference, it's a disappointment with this team. But you you, you could be looking at a at a record 
somewhere in the range of like 25 and 5, uh, maybe even 26 and 4 ish type record. Um, so, you know, uh, that, that would get them ranked. I think with that record, they would come into the tournament, maybe a 6 7 seed, something like that, potentially higher, you know, if they run the table in the Ivy. We'll just have to see. Uh, it's all on Amaker to push the right buttons. And, uh, you know, draw up the right X's and O's. So, uh, anyway, that's the, that's the schedule. Uh, they Well, they do start Ivy League play on January 18th with Dartmouth. Uh, that's the schedule. Let's go ahead and put up the pros and cons, the strengths and weaknesses of this team. What are Harvard's strengths going into this season? Well, as I said, high-level talent. I mean, you can't beat that. That's the number one strength you should look for in any team, right? They have the roster. They have the talent. They have the high ceiling. Uh, experience. Uh, they have seven or eight seniors who are going to play a lot this season. They have a sophomore who's going to play a lot, but he, he played last year and he was the Ivy, Ivy League freshman of the year. So uh, they have tons of experience. They have tons of depth. They have good size, especially for their conference. I don't think anybody in the Ivy League is going to be able to handle their size. They have multiple 6'8", 6'9", 6'10 guys. The guards have good size. Kirkwood, as, as a you know, guard slash you know, wing type at 6'7", has a really good size. And they have playmakers. Uh, Bryce Aiken, I mean, the guy's a stud. He can score from anywhere on the court. They have... Like I said, they have the kind of team that should be able to beat you at any position from any spot on the floor. So they have the playmaking ability. Let's go ahead and talk about the weaknesses this team has. Uh, below average defense. You, they just have to tighten up the defense. Uh, that's on Coach Amaker to get that done. They have to defend for 40 minutes. They have to commit to that end of the court. I think they can do it uh, because they have the experience and... Uh, and senior leadership on this team, I think they will defend at a much higher level this year. And then turnovers. Turnovers is absolutely huge. There's only one way to go from last season's turnover number, and that's up. They ranked basically very close to dead last in the entire country in turnovers per game. So you can only get better from there. Uh, Bryce Aiken's been doing this for a while now. He's going to be a senior. He's going to be playing basketball professionally somewhere next year. So I expect him to get the turnovers down. I think Harvard's going to be fine there. I think they'll be improved there. And, you know, both of what I just talked about... Uh, uh, falls into that third category, underachieving. So if they tighten up the defense, if they... If they cut down on the turnovers, if they don't get hit by injuries like they have been the last couple of years, I don't think they'll be an underachieving team this year. I think, if anything, they'll overachieve to what people expect. A lot of people that I talk to in town who are sharps, who bet sports for a living, they are high on Harvard this year. So I don't think it's a huge secret that they have the potential to do some serious damage in March this year. Um, but I don't, ha I don't really see anybody ranking them in a top 25. I think uh, Jeff Goodman had him in his poll in the top 25. So, uh, you know, I have him a little bit higher than most people. But I just think that I think they can make a statement in Orlando. And then after that, I think they can dominate the Ivy League. So I don't see any reason they can't be 25 and 5, 26 and 4 type team that's ranked all season. Uh, I think they can very easily come into uh, March Madness as a ranked team. All right, so that just about concludes our preview on the number 24 Harvard Crimson for the 2019 upcoming college basketball season. And just to let you know, I make college football and college basketball videos all throughout the year. They're the only two sports I research and study. So hopefully if everything falls right, uh, watching these videos might even make you a little bit of money. Who knows? So anyway, please subscribe if you haven't yet to the channel. Uh, if you're a Harvard fan or you got anything out of this video, please hit the like button. It only takes you a second. Uh, this is a new channel. I'm trying to get it off the ground. So if you want me to continue making these in-depth previews, please subscribe and hit the like button. Uh, also, your comments are very much wanted. Uh, let, let me know what you like or didn't like, agree with or disagree with about the video. And once again, uh, we'll talk about the future odds. 400 to 1, my final verdict, the bottom line on Harvard. At 400 to 1, I still think uh, it's a good bet. Like I said, if you're a fan, you want something to root for all year, you take 20 bucks or 50 bucks, 
you know, you can win $8,000 on a $20 bet. You can win $20,000 on a $50 bet. It gives you three or four months of entertainment to follow these guys throughout the year. I don't think you'll be disappointed because I think they're going to be a good team with a good record all year. Again, in March Madness, that's a crapshoot. Anything could happen. So why not have your money on a team that's 400 to 1, right? So that'll wrap it up. Uh, tomorrow we will uh, get into number 23. We'll continue to count this down. So uh, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. Thanks again and have a great day.